Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Vincenzo Fiorentini. I'm the science attaché here at the Italian Embassy in Berlin. And I'm on the, in real life, let's say, I'm a physics professor at the University of Cagliari in Italy. So this webinar today is uh, a celebration of the Italian National Space Day, which is a, a memorialization, let's say, of the 1964 launch of the uh, first launch of satellite by Italy, as it turns out, as the third country in history. Uh, so the guiding team today is uh, about space telescopes, current and future. Although we are also going to be hearing about uh, uh, results from the earthbound radio wave array uh, and event horizon telescope, um, especially uh, black hole imaging. I think. So our main focus today is on astrophysics, although I expect that there will be mention of the technological and economic aspects and so on. We have four speakers who will touch on different aspects and whom I will introduce to you momentarily. And before that, we have a video message by the Ambassador of Italy to Germany, His Excellency Romando Arricchio, and I hope I will be able to share the video. I don't, I don't hear the, the, the audio. Vincenzo. Oh, you can hear the audio. Oh, okay. okay, okay. Oh, I can't. So, sorry. Yeah, it's uh, my mistake. I'm sorry. So, yeah, it's too bad. It is a pleasure for me to open this event okay. organized on the occasion of the second National Space Day. Today, we celebrate the launch of San Marco One the first satellite launched by Italy as the third nation in history in 1964. This initiative is accomplished with the participation of Sci Network, the Association of Italian Scientists in Germany, which I have the honor to chair. This is a crucial moment for European space policy. During the last ESA ministerial meeting in Paris, the Italian government reaffirmed its commitment and ambition to be one of the leading European nations in the sector. In terms of investments and technology know-how, we will contribute to the budget organization up to 3.1 billion euro in the coming five years. Italy plays a fundamental role in many areas of the new space economy, a sector which is already crucial for the pursuit of scientific, economic, and more and more security goals. Space economy has already achieved a turnover between 250 and 450 billion euros and is expected to reach more than 1 trillion US dollar by 2040. Italy is one of the few countries very active in all the three sectors which are the backbone of the space economy today. First, upstream space sector focus on the development and manufacturing of the space infrastructure. Second, downstream space sector represented by the day-by-day down-to-earth activities, such as data or signals management. And third, space derivate activities in other sectors. This is possible thanks to the commitment of our government and to the hard work of our companies. Both the major players of our industry as well as more than 250 successful small and medium companies compete every day in the global markets. In this context, today's event will focus on a specific and crucial area where the scientific collaboration between European and American partners is achieving significant results. We will focus on the creation launch and use of vehicles, probes, and space telescopes for the exploration of this space. Precisely these modern space telescopes, at the core of our event today, can open up new perspectives for astrophysics. Primordial universe and the formation of early stars and galaxies, birth of stars and planetary systems, extreme compact objects such as black holes and neutron stars. What a fascinating subject. 
and what an incredible role science can play to further explore the topic of the origin of the universe. The extraordinary pictures sent by the Webb telescope are an eye disposal of humanity currently stationing about a million miles away from the Earth. New pictures of the baby universe might provide the evidence that galaxies started forming faster and earlier than expected. We hope this is only the first of a long series of discoveries and that our current knowledge will be more and more challenged in a disruptive way by the data and information that technology is making more and more available. Our speakers today are astrophysicists who work directly with the most important space and terrestrial telescopes, ESO, Webb, Event Horizon, Euclid, both at the observation and theoretical interpretive level. I would like to thank all of them, Professor Roy, Professor Fontana, Professor Nizini, and Professor Rizzola. Thank you very much for your presence and effort today. In renewing my warm greetings, I now leave the floor to the speakers and I wish all those present a fruitful meeting on this amazing subject. Okay. Thanks to Ambassador Barrique for this message. I hope you can hear me again. And uh, so let's now come to our speakers. So we have with us, uh, as you already heard, Adriano Fontana from ENAF, the National Astrophysics Institute of Italy, Ornella Nizzini, also from ENAF, uh, Luciano Rezzolla from the Theoretical Physics Institute at the University of Frankfurt, and Alessandra Roy from DLR, the German Aerospace Agency. Now it looks that more or less the alphabetic order roughly agrees with the with the thematic ordering, and so uh, we will start with Adriano Fontana, who is the head of uh, the Optical and Near Infrared Division at ENAF and uh, principal manager of the Large Binocular Telescope. His, uh, his activities in the area of the galaxy formation, the early universe, and so his contribution today would be new eyes on the history of the universe, and so I leave the floor to Adriano. So, thank Okay. Thank you, Vincenzo. For some reason, I'm not able to share the content anymore. Don't know why. It's funny how everything works perfectly yes. offline and then stops it, stops it working. working uh, three minutes ago. <laughs> You say you can't yeah. share content unless the host, eco host or presenter makes you the presenter. So, yeah. Whatever it means. Uh, Sign privileges, uh, Adriano Fontana, presenter. Um, share a document. At moment. Sorry. Maybe someone. Big some presenter. Other. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Here it is. Yes. Okay. So thank you. First of all, welcome everybody, uh, and uh, thank you very much, Vincenzo, and the embassy for the kind uh, invitation. Um, the title I I have uh, uh, been asked to uh, to present here is uh, "New Eyes on the History of the Universe," and I will stress. Uh, uh, how we are today, we are able to recover and understand and study the entire history uh, of the universe and uh, um, using the space telescopes uh, that uh, the ambassador has just uh, mentioned. Um, so as we're talking about the history, let me go briefly through, say, an historical uh, tour, uh, just to say that when we talk about the history of the universe, we're talking about cosmology, and cosmology is uh, one of the most ancient uh, 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 human sciences, because the question of about how the universe, how the, the reality around us, how the universe uh, has uh, started and what is made of is probably as old as mankind. As mankind. And uh, 
is uh, there are two aspects in cosmology. One is in exploring the universe, so exploring the universe out of the Earth and understanding uh, what uh, what is made of. And as we will see today, now we are back able to go back uh, nearly to the beginning of time. Uh, but again, the, the question of when it started there was a question uh, always present in, 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 in history. And the second is understanding the universe. So understanding what are the fundamental forces that shape the universe and the matter around us. These questions were present from the beginning and, for instance, were present in the uh, Aristotelian cosmology. This is a drawing uh, of the idea, as you know, the old idea that the, sun, that the Earth was at the center of the solar system and they were, the entire universe was made of a few, uh, of four, in this case, uh, uh, fundamental elements. Now, as you know, uh, these, uh, the advent of telescope has provided us with the proof that this uh, uh, idea was wrong, and we started the exploration of the universe. This is the drawing that Galileo did the first time he put his eyes on a telescope and looked at the Milky Way. And uh, in his very words, he said the Milky Way is nothing else but a mass of innumerable stars. So you may imagine the uh, probably the emotion and the surprise he had while looking at the, the telescope, uh, uh, this, this tiny telescope at the time, and realizing that uh, this uh, milky way, these white stripes uh, across the sky, were actually made uh, uh, was actually made uh, of uh, a, number, a number uh, of, uh, of stars. Um, from this discovery, it took about an early um, two centuries to eventually explore our galaxy, which means understanding where the sun, how the, where the sun is compared to the other star, how is, the, what is the shape of the, of the Milky Way. Today, we know that the Milky Way is the so-called spiral galaxy. If we were uh, on a starship outside the Milky Way looking from top, we would probably see uh, something like this there. And as you may see, the sun is located very far from the center. So not only this, the Earth is not at the center of the solar system, but also the sun is very far away in the outskirts of the galaxy. And it's just one of a hundred billion stars which make the, um, the Milky Way. At the same time, over the same amount of time from the early 1750s to uh, 1920s or so, uh, the, started the exploration of the outer universe, so what is outside the Milky Way. And again, it took uh, nearly two centuries to eventually realize that outside the Milky Way, there are many, many other galaxies. And this was proved, uh, eventually was definitely proved by Hubble in 29 by measuring the distance of Andromeda galaxy. Uh, now we know that the universe contain uh, uh, hundreds of billions of galaxies. So each of them will, will contain from... Uh, from billions to millions of, uh, of stars. And so the Milky Way is just one of these billions of galaxies which come in, a different, in very different shapes and sizes. So there are galaxies much bigger and galaxies much smaller than the Milky Way, a variety of shapes, uh, et cetera. So as you may see, the, uh, there has been a complete transformation of our understanding of how the universe is made of uh, on, uh, on a large scale. And if you go to even larger scales, we know today that the universe um, is the galaxies in the universe are distributed uh, along what we call the large scale structures, which is which are these web with sort of uh, web of uh, structures uh, in in yellow and in red. You see the denser structures where most of the galaxy resides, and you also have a number of uh, voids uh, regions which are nearly devoid uh, of galaxies. And if you ask yourself why we went up in this, uh, in this configuration, the answer is gravity. So gravity, the gravitational force that keep us sitting on a chair, uh, is eventually shaping the large scale distribution of galaxies because the denser regions uh, uh, accrete uh, the, uh, the other regions and eventually galaxy move uh, closer and closer to the central area. And so it is easy to show that with computer simulations that this shape is due to the force of gravity over the entire um, range of the universe. Um, the other important ingredient that was discovered by Hubble in another discovery always in, the 20, in the 1929 was the discovery that the universe is expanding. This is a, his original draft. As you may see, he looked at he measured the distance of galaxies and he realized that the farther a galaxy is, 
uh, this, the, far, the, the, the fastest is uh, uh, moving out from, uh, from the Earth. So in modern, uh, um, with modern observations, we have a much clearer view of, these, uh, of this process. Uh, when a galaxy is far away from us, uh, it, it is clearly, apparently, much uh, faster in rushing out uh, from the Earth, uh, from the Milky Way. And this uh, is the proof that the universe is expanding. So uh, the entire universe is expanding. There is no center uh, of the universe as such, but all objects inside the universe uh, are receding from, from each other. So this is a, fun, is a great uh, tool to some extent, because this way we can use telescopes as time machine. So this is an example of one image taken from the Hubble Space Telescope a few years ago. Um, what, what you can see in this image, so this image has been taken by looking at, in a single uh, point of the sky, a very small region of the sky, much smaller, say, than the moon or what, something where by naked eye you see nothing. And the, the power of, J, of, uh, of space telescope in this case was able to see uh, many objects on the same uh, direction. Every object you see in this image uh, is uh, a galaxy at, observed at different distances from the, from the Earth. Now, uh, more, objects which are more distant uh, uh, from us are also, are also farther away from us, uh, which means that the time the light has uh, needed to reach us uh, is longer. So when a galaxy is, uh, say, one billion of light years from, uh, from us, uh, this implies that uh, uh, the light has taken one uh, um, billion of years to reach us. So we see this galaxy uh, as it, it's not strictly correct, uh, I'm sure you will uh, uh, not blame me if I say that we're looking at this galaxy as if as it was uh, one billion of years ago, and we can play this game even farther and look to galaxies which were 10 billions of years uh, ago. So what you see in this image is that galaxies have a different size and shape, and the reason is because we are looking at more and more distant galaxies, the smaller one you see are also the farther away, and, uh, uh, and we see them changing uh, uh, when we see these galaxies at different uh, distances, they correspond to different epochs in time. And so we can look at the, how the galaxies change across the cosmic time. So this is one example of what we see. Uh, we take galaxies that we know are the uh, progenitors of the Milky Way. So if observed today, they look like uh, pretty much like the Milky Way. And we can see them in different epochs in the universe. From up uh, to below, uh, you may see how these progenitors changed uh, over time when you go back from today to uh, a period uh, in the lower uh, bottom right when they were only, uh, I don't know if you see my cursor, um, when they were only two uh, billions of years after the Big Bang. So as you may see, galaxies change. A single galaxy like the Milky Way has an history, changes with time and becomes smaller and smaller as we go back uh, to, uh, to, toward the, uh, the Big Bang. Because galaxies formed from very small seeds and, grow, and grew and, uh, uh, and formed uh, over, uh, um, over many billions of years. The, my point here, my crucial point, is that this is something that we are able to see with our telescopes. So it's not a speculation, it's not a theory, it's an observation, it's something that we can prove uh, definitely with observations. This way, we can go back uh, uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope, we have been able to go back uh, nearly to half a billion uh, of years after the Big Bang and see uh, galaxies when they were still young. We actually have another image of the universe, which is still younger. Uh, it is so-called the cosmic microwave background. Again, was done with, uh, with a number of satellites. The most recent one is Planck, a European satellite. And the light you see, this is the entire sky. And the light you see is the relic light uh, uh, emitted in the very early epoch of the Big Bang, uh, only 300 of the order of 300,000 years after the Big Bang. So imagine you are in an oven, and this is the relic of the warm uh, radiation you have uh, in the universe at the time where it was made only of uh, free particles. There were, there were no stars, uh, no planets, no whatever, only gas uh, uh, produced during the Big Bang. So, and again, this is an observation. So it's telling us uh, as you, the, the reddest points are the points where there, were, there was most gas. The gas was denser. 
And from these uh, uh, red points, uh, eventually over time, uh, where the denser regions were, uh, slowly all the gas uh, started to fall on in this denser region. And that's, these are the regions from where uh, the first stars uh, uh, were created. So based on these observations, we are now able to, um, to make a drawing. This is a cartoon, it's not a, a scientific observations, but it's incredibly, I think it's, uh, it's really one of the uh, most fundamental discoveries of, uh, of science in the last century, is the fact that we have observed with our telescope and understood uh, that the, uh, the universe has an history. So there is uh, the so-called Big Bang, a very dense uh, uh, region, a very dense epoch at the beginning of time. Uh, we have uh, the, uh, the cosmic microwave background, and then there is an epoch uh, which we call the Dark Ages, where we, nothing was, well, the universe was really a boring place. There was no star, nothing was happening. Out of this uh, epoch, uh, uh, the first stars uh, uh, started to form. And eventually, from the very first stars, then the first, the first galaxies came, and eventually uh, they changed over time until the, the galaxies that we know today. Again, I think the very fact that we are able to prove that this picture is actually what happened in reality is by itself a, a major discovery of mankind. Now, the last, as, the last step, so as you may see, there is uh, these so-called dark ages, uh, but in, in practice, we are not able, with the previous telescopes, we were not able to reach uh, the first, uh, to observe the first star in the range about 400 millions uh, after the Big Bang. This is an epoch that previous telescopes, for a number of reasons, are unable to access. And, and here is where the, the James Webb Space Telescope, as telescope comes in. Uh, you probably heard it on the on the on the news. Uh, so this is the new satellite launched by NASA, uh, the Christmas Day, and uh, it's an infrared telescope. And later on, uh, uh, it will be described. Alessandra will describe why we need to go into the infrared to observe, uh, uh, to observe. Uh, why we need to go to space to observe in the infrared. Uh, this uh, this is a telescope as large as the telescope we build on the ground. We have built on the ground, but launched uh, into into space. The upper part is completely, um, is, is very cold. Uh, what you see most of the telescope is 200 degrees below zero, uh, while the lower part is exposed to the sun and, uh, and is 80 degrees uh, above zero. <clears throat> and, and here is uh, uh, the very first observations with James Webb, which are only a couple of months old, so it's really a new thing. Uh, has proved to be to be able to break uh, this barrier of a half a million uh, a half a billion years from the Big Bang. These are the first very first images delivered by uh, the uh, James Webb, and I'm proud to say these are the images that we obtained uh, uh, on July 16, only two days uh, uh, after the telescope has started the scientific observations. Uh, today are the deepest uh, uh, observations ever taken with uh, Webb, and if you see these two small dots, which are shown here at the center, are the very first galaxies that has been detected in the first half of the uh, billion years after the Big Bang. So when galaxies were really start, the first stars were really starting uh, uh, to form. Uh, as, by the way, the ambassador said, these galaxies have been a surprise because we were not expecting to find uh, uh, two galaxies in the very first data uh, based on the Results from from previous telescopes, we were expecting to see only maybe uh, one with a probability of 10%. So we were expecting essentially zero. We actually identified two, and uh, other observations followed after are showing that there are many more galaxies in the early universe than we thought uh, uh, were in place. And so this may uh, imply that there are new mechanisms that we still don't know, which help the forming stars uh, in the very early uh, universe. Um, if you want to know more, there is a, um, a nice uh, press release from, from NASA about our results, and I'm, um, I'm sure you, you may find uh, more, more details uh, there. Uh, let me just finish uh, with the last couple of slides. Uh, so what, what I described so far is, the, is how we are able to go back in time and observe uh, the more distant galaxies, which were the most distant objects, which were uh, the light is coming from an epoch when the universe was incredibly uh, younger than today. Uh, but we can try to understand, you remember the second 
goal of cosmology is understanding the basic principles. And while well, you can put all these things together, you can put uh, together the cosmic microwave background, the galaxy large scale distribution, and the measurements of the Hubble constant, uh, all together into a mathematical scenario, and you get uh, what we call the cosmological model. Now, on the one side, this is a great success because it, it really gives uh, uh, an excellent understanding of uh, what happened, but we have to pay a price. And the price is that we had to introduce two um, something, which uh, uh, need, we need to invoke to understand exactly in the detail what we see. One is the so-called dark matter. And the reason is that we see that gravity, uh, the way galaxies accrete uh, and move, uh, uh, cannot be explained by the matter that we see in galaxies. We need to have an additional amount of matter that we call dark matter, um, which is much more than the ordinary matter uh, and contributes only gravitationally. So it's something that is probably, uh, that has never been detected in any of our instruments, in any you know, of our laboratories on the ground. We have no essentially, no clear idea of what it is, but it's dominant in terms of matter. So most of the matter of the universe is in something that we call dark matter, and we have no idea at the moment what it is. And even worse, uh, there is a dark energy, which is responsible for uh, ex the expansion of the universe. So the universe is not uh, uh, slowing down the expansion, but is rather uh, increasing the uh, speed of expansion. And we need to invoke another uh, sort of energy with negative pressure that we call dark energy. So the paradox is that the universe is made, uh, the, the entire energy of the universe, 95% of this universe, is made of something we have no idea about. And we have just uh, nice names, dark matter and dark energy. We have plenty of theories in competition to describe them, but no other clear clue to understand what they are. And on top of this, uh, the measurements of the, uh, uh, of the expansion of the universe, which are one of these ingredients, uh, are also intentioned. We measured them, uh, we measured this uh, expansion speed in two ways, uh, which are si close to, but are, not, uh, but are not identical. And unfortunately, these two methods give two numbers which are incompatible one with the other, intention one with the other. And again, this may be an evidence that there is something fundamental that we still don't understand. And, uh, and the only way we know progress is to make better observations and to constrain theories. Uh, that is why uh, ESA, the European Space Agency, is launching next year uh, a new satellite, Euclid, because we are also very good in, in building telescopes, not only the Americans. And Italy and Germany and France had a, a major participation in, these, uh, in the construction of this telescope, which is currently in Torino. Uh, in the Alenia um, laboratories, uh, uh, and uh, and this uh, at variance with Webb, which is observing one few objects every time, this uh, telescope will observe uh, the entire sky, and will uh, improve our our constraints and our understanding on the nature of dark energy and dark matter by a factor of a hundred compared to whatever we know today. So we hope that this telescope will be able to shed new life, new light uh, on, uh, on the nature of these uh, uh, weird uh, components of the universe. So just to conclude, uh, uh, the, the positive part is I think we have a very solid observational evidence that uh, the Big Bang model is correct. The universe has an history that we can see in our telescopes, but at the same time, if we look at the, <clears throat> at the fundamental laws of physics that explain uh, the behavior and the history of the universe, uh, we have to invoke, uh, uh, we have identified components that we have not uh, uh, yet uh, constrained and understood in our laboratories. And so the search uh, both on the ground and in space uh, continues. Thank you, Adriano. It's very exceedingly interesting, I would say. I, so I I guess we should uh, go on with the contributions, except for, uh, let's say, urgent, urgent questions. And uh, so I, I'm not sure whether everybody will see, will see the chat or not. But I mean, so uh, of course, participants can uh, can uh, ask questions in the chat. 
and um, and obviously we can ask questions mutually. So I guess I, I, I suggest that we go ahead with the second contribution, which is, uh, as I mentioned, by Brunello Nizzini, who is the head of the Star Planetary Formation Division of ENAF. And her research is in the field of star formation and phenomena associated with young stars, so planetary formation, planetary systems, and exoplanets. And their contribution is, as you can see already, is uh, from star birth to plant formation, the web revolution that promises to explain why web is going to be useful to understand these problems. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Vincenzo, for uh, inviting me to this uh, event. Um, so I'm Brunella Nisini from the Rome Observatory. And um, now in this, uh, in this talk, uh, I would like to, to bring you uh, from the farest and oldest astronomical sources in the universe uh, described by Adriano to the closest and the younger objects uh, in our local universe, uh, which are the stars uh, at the beginning of their uh, life. Uh, in particular, I want to show you uh, how the James Webb Telescope that, that Adriano de briefly described uh, promises to be a fundamental instrument uh, for the study of such um, objects and uh, for the understanding how stars, our uh, own uh, sun, um, uh, are uh, created. Uh, let's begin uh, this journey uh, on where uh, the star crabbers are located. Uh, stars from uh, within giant molecular clouds, uh, which are dense and cold, uh, uh, clouds, uh, clouds of gas and dust uh, located on the, uh, in the Milky Way, in the plane of our, our own galaxy. Uh, here I show you in particular a composite image uh, of the Milky Way obtained, obtained at optical wavelength from the European Southern Observatory. Um, the dark area uh, in the galactic plane uh, are the location of these uh, molecular clouds which appear dark because uh, they are so thick that they don't, uh, do not allow the light of background stars uh, to pass through. Uh, such dark regions uh, can be also seen by naked eyes, in particular uh, in clear nights uh, without uh, uh, um, illumination from the moon or from uh, human activity, like uh, shown in this uh, very nice picture uh, taken at the European Southern Observatory in, in Chile. Um, but let's have a look, uh, at, a closer look on, on how uh, molecular cl clouds uh, um, looks like. Uh, these are the famous uh, um, pillar of creation uh, located in the Eagle Nebula at about uh, 6,000 um, uh, light years from us. Uh, this is a very famous um, uh, image, optical image so obtained with the Hubble Space Telescope. And in this image, the clouds appear as a dark spot against a bright background created by the light of um, recently formed diamond stars. Uh, the, the radiation from these stars illuminate and erode the dense cloud from outside, creating this extremely scenic uh, sculpture. If you look at this uh, uh, image uh, from uh, the James Webb, um, which is shown here, uh, you can see uh, immediately that uh, um, at the infrared wavelength, um, the infrared wavelength, wavelength uh, are able to reveal much more details of what's happening inside uh, uh, this region. Because uh, the, in the, the infrared wavelength, we are able to penetrate uh, in, in, in the, inside the, 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 molecular, uh, the thick dust cloud, allowing to observe both the background stars that remained uh, hidden behind the diffuse interstellar material, but more importantly, to detect newly formed stars which are um, enshrouded within the densest clouds. And, and these are the, the red spots uh, that you can see located on the, on the skin of the, of the clouds which uh, in the optical image are uh, completely hidden. Uh, but, um, okay, let's uh, briefly, briefly see how a star, a star like our sun form. Uh, here in the upper panels, I show the different phases of, of uh, the formation of a star, of a star that last uh, about uh, 10 million years. 
while um, it, for comparison in the bottom panel, uh, I show how these uh, phases uh, appear when observed by ground-based telescopes at different wavelengths. Um, the formation of a star begins with a gravi gravitational collapse and fragmentation of a molecular cloud by, due to its own uh, gravity uh, into very dense clumps. Uh, these clumps uh, increase in mass and temperature as surrounding material is accumulated uh, to accretion. Uh, this process led to the formation of a stellar-like object uh, called a protostar in about 10,000 uh, years. The surrounding material continues to accrete on the nascent protostar and is progressively uh, flattened uh, due to the rotation, uh, forming a circostellar accretion disk. As material falls into the protostar, uh, um, part of it is also ejected in the direction perpendicular to the accretion disk due to interaction with the local magnetic field, creating um, energetic collimated jets uh, that are seen in the, in the bottom panel, for example, uh, in, uh, in uh, um, uh, images uh, from the uh, space uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, in a time of about uh, one million of year, uh, the material of the surrounding cloud is exhausted and the accretion ends. And around uh, the newly formed star, a, a, a residual disk is left where planets are progressively formed. Um, of all these phases, uh, the most uh, um, Let's say that the most elusive one is the protostellar phase. Um, uh, since uh, young star, uh, protostars are very difficult to be observed directly. And this is where uh, the near infrared, the, the, the infrared uh, observation by the James Webb uh, comes uh, to, to be important. Um, in fact, uh, one can see that uh, young protostars are often not that, that directly detected but their presence revealed by their um, energetic ejection of matter that propagates at a large distance from the central source, creating uh, these scenic uh, collimated jets uh, that sometimes uh, resemble uh, laser swords, uh, the laser swords of uh, Star, star Wars. Um, however, uh, you can see in this uh, inset uh, the, the, the region around the protostar itself uh, remain obscure. Uh, therefore, we know very little about the central engine that give rise to the, to the jets and to the accretion process. And here it's where the James Webb um, is important because uh, as we go uh, at a longer and longer wavelength, uh, as we have seen, uh, the, the light uh, can penetrate inside the, 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 the thick envelope around the protostar and reveal the protostar uh, itself, uh, like in this image obtained with the, the two instruments, Nirkam and uh, Miri. Um, um, even more important, uh, instrument like uh, Miri, which is the instrument uh, uh, observing at the longest wavelength, up to 20 micron, uh, provide spectra of the central protostars. The spectra, which, mean, which means that we, through the spectra, we can study the composition of the dust and gas um, around the protostar, so in the, for example, in the accretion disk. Uh, here I show one of the first uh, MIRI spectra published uh, on a protostellar object. Uh, the, panel, the panel above shows the different molecular um, absorption bands uh, caused by, the, by cold dust uh, uh, located in the protostellar envelope and disk. The spectrum reveals uh, the presence of abundant uh, complex organic molecules, that is, uh, chains of um, uh, long uh, um, uh, chains of carbon uh, uh, molecules. Uh, that, that will be the building blocks uh, of uh, future planets uh, to, that will be formed on, in the circostellar disk. Um, in an enlargement of the region above, you can also notice that the spectrum is full of uh, narrow emission lines uh, due to warm circostellar gas uh, heated by the protostar. Interestingly, you can notice that uh, the, uh, this, this very first stage of stellar evolution 
it has been already formed a, a large quantity of uh, water vapor that will be eventually available to be incorporated in the planet's atmospheres. This is a result already uh, known from uh, previous observations with infrared uh, space facilities, uh, such as uh, the Escher satel uh, satellite of the European Space Agency that uh, was operating about 10, 10 years ago. Um, but uh, the James Webb uh, will, um, will uh, be now able to follow uh, this study with much more details uh, thanks to its higher uh, uh, angular resolution and sensitivity. Um, and now, in, in, indeed, uh, uh, we, we already know that um, uh, the, the stellar disk and around these young stars uh, is where uh, future planetary system uh, form. Um, here, uh, uh, on, on the left, I show you a, an image. So this, this is a, a real image of a protoplanetary disk observed in a, in, a, in a young star of about one uh, um, one million years, so a bit uh, older, let's say, than the protostar that I showed you before, obtained with the um, uh, ALMA um, array, which is a complex of more than 60 telescopes um, of the European Southern Observatory uh, located in Chile. And, and, and this image, um, uh, when you observe at millimeter wavelength, uh, you are uh, sensible to cold, uh, uh, emission from the dust, uh, both uh, uh, not only on the central object, on the central stars, but also on the circumstellar disk. And this, uh, this image already um, showed that the disk presents impressive structures, uh, which cavities, uh, rings, uh, probably indicated the location of newly formed uh, planets that, that have carved out the disk material uh, growing mass. Um, one of the main aim of the James Webb will be to probe uh, um, the region of this protoplanetary disk, uh, delivering important information about uh, the, mole the molecules that are present uh, in the still forming planetary system. Uh, on the left, uh, there is a, a, a simulated spectrum of, um, of the, uh, the James Webb spectrometer. Um, showing that uh, we, in these early phases, we expect to see uh, uh, many organic molecules like uh, methane, carbon dioxide, and water again. And the study of the, the chemical inventory in this uh, protoplanetary disk will help to understand whether the chemical composition observed in uh, exoplanets, in, in the atmosphere of planets uh, different in, outside our solar system, is inherited from the very early phases uh, of stellar formation from the disk material forming uh, the planets themselves. Um, and, um, and in fact, uh, um, to now, uh, up to now, we know um, more than 5,000 exoplanets have been uh, discovered. Uh, and they all showed a, a large diversity of properties, um, also a, a large diversity of uh, planetary systems, uh, as shown in the sketch on the, on the right. Uh, these different properties probably reflect the different characteristics of the protoplanetary disk from where they have been formed. Uh, that uh, presents a large diversity of shapes, uh, sizes, uh, and ring displacement, like uh, shown in the picture on the, on the left, uh, obtained again with, uh, with ALMA. Um, now, the James Webb will be able also to, to one of the main uh, goals of James Webb uh, is to study uh, the, these uh, exoplanets, and surely it will be able to discover um, many new of them. But uh, the, the real challenge will be to disclose the composition of the planet's atmosphere. Um, this uh, is obtained uh, with a technique called uh, transitive, te uh, transitive te technique. Uh, once a planet transit uh, in front of, a, of its star, the stellar brightness uh, uh, diminishes by a small but detectable amount uh, due to the planet block blocking uh, part of the light. Uh, if one uses a spectrometer in which the light is dispersed at different wavelengths, 
the amount of light that, that is absorbed at each wavelength depends on the atmospheric composition of the planets, since uh, different molecules, molecules absorb more or, or less uh, um, uh, of the stellar light. Here, for example, it is shown the spectrum of uh, the exoplanet uh, WUST 39b, the planet of the side of Saturn, but uh, much shorter due to the fact that its orbit is much closer to, the, to, the, to its star. Uh, the transmission, this transmission spectrum uh, uh, displays features of, of basic organic molecules, um, and the spectra like, uh, like this uh, help astronomers to understand the physical processes occurring on the planet's atmospheres, as well as their modifications uh, due to the interaction with the radiation from the, from the star. Uh, this is all very nice, but um, I think that the, the ultimate frontier for the web would be to unveil the, the atmosphere of planets like uh, the one of our, of our Earth, potentially candidate for sustain life uh, as our own. Um, and this will be searched um, among those planets located in the so-called habitable zone. What is the habitable zone? Is the, it is defined as the orbital region around the star in which an Earth-like planet can possess liquid water on its surface and thus possibly support life. This zone depends both on the characteristic of the star and on the distance of the planet, like shown in this graph, um, in this plot. Uh, the more massive is the star, um, the, the more is hotter, and thus the larger the distance uh, of the, of the uh, habitable zone, um, uh, as shown in this figure, um, uh, where the habitable zone is uh, defined uh, as, a as a strip uh, with possible candidate uh, located inside it. Uh, you can see that uh, um, there are uh, possible uh, Earth-like planets uh, like our, uh, our own Earth, which are located much closer to the, their uh, central star, like, for example, Pros Proxima Centauri B, uh, since the, the, their, uh, their, um, the central star is much uh, uh, colder than the sun. Uh, the inset shows how transmission spectrum of our own Earth would like, as seen from other systems. Uh, for terrestrial, terrestrial worlds, um, O2, ozone, methane, and CO2 are expected to be the most important signatures of biological activity. Uh, let me stress that the mere detection of these molecules uh, uh, does not mean that the life is present in these planets, uh, as they, um, all these molecules can be produced uh, also by uh, abiotic factors. Uh, however, I think it will be a great step forward in the understanding of the emergency of possible forms of, of life, uh, like uh, our own, in the universe uh, to, to observe uh, um, uh, other uh, planets with, with atmospheric features like this. And uh, I'll stop here. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Brunella. So this is uh, apparently uh would be a long, a long, a long work that, that uh, with great promise, I would say. Um, we hope so. <laughs> you hope so. So, so I, I understand. Actually, you, you didn't mention it, but I understand you are more or less the only or one of the few Italians with, uh, with observation with with uh, telescope time on web at the moment. Is that correct? Well, I'm a, w one of the, um, the PI of uh, the, I think, a nine or ten uh, uh, proposal that have been accepted during cycle one mm -hmm. of, the, of, of observation. But there are many other Italian, actually, many other Itali Italian uh, researchers involved in other, uh, in other projects, uh, even uh, not as PI. So mm -hmm. we really expect okay. that uh, the Italian community will be very active. Although sure. the James Webb is not, uh, has not been supported uh, by, by Italy, let's say, <laughs> you, mm -hmm. uh, we are uh, actively working on it. Okay. So thank you again. And so we move to the next uh, contribution. Luciano Rezzola is the chair of theoretical astrophysics at Frankfurt University, and he's a 
theorist of gravitational and general relativity. So his focus is on uh, is on uh, compact objects, so uh, black holes and neutron stars, uh, which he studies by by uh, by a theory and simulation. And among other things, he is not surprisingly, I suppose, a board member of the Event Horizon Telescope. So his uh, his talk is about how do you image a black hole, and is uh, it is about the you know, the famous the famous um, black hole picture that we've seen uh, everywhere, more or less, in recent years. So um, let me share my screen. <clears throat> I hope you can see my screen. And I would like to start by thanking Vincenzo and the embassy for this kind invitation to, to this event, which I have enjoyed very much so far. And the title of my presentation is How Do You Image a Black Hole? And this is um, a presentation meant for um, you know, people who have a genetic interest in astronomy. I will not be too technical, and I'm, of course, ready to give you more details um, if there are questions. So let me just dive in into the, the actual problem, OK? So if you want to answer that question, how do you take a photo of a black hole, you have to cope with the fact that black holes are the most compact objects known. If you take an object of a given mass, M, there is nothing smaller than a black hole that you can produce with that mass. So in addition, um, black holes are normally, and luckily for us, at astronomical distances. This means that in practice, if you take these two points together, they have an extremely small resolvable size when projected on the sky. And there is a limit to what technologically we can observe in terms of resolution. This is roughly 10 micro arc seconds. And for those of you uh, not familiar with this idea is essentially the size at which a rice grain would appear if you were to look at it at a distance between us and say New York. Okay, so that's the kind of size we're talking about. So considering all of these problems, then essentially in order to take an object, a photo of an, ob of a, of a, an object like a black hole, you have two requirements that need to be met. The first one is that you need very massive black holes because these are the black holes that have the largest possible size and that they are sufficiently close to us because if they are too far away, no matter how big they are, you simply will not be able to see them. And so you go through your list of black holes known in, in, in astronomy and there are just two that survive this very uh, strict criteria. And these are M87 star and Sagittarius A star. These are two black holes on two very different galaxies. M87 star is in uh, M87, uh, Messier 87. It's a, a, a supergiant galaxy, um, which is uh, billions, uh, four billions solar masses in mass, but it's far away. And uh, the next one is Sagittarius A star, which is actually the black hole in our own galaxy. It's much smaller. It's just four million solar masses, but you essentially cancel out the difference in size by having it closer to us. And all the others are at least a factor three smaller in size. And so it's really not in any uh, way close to observations right now. So how do you actually observe them? Well, you use a technique which is called VLBI, your very long baseline interferometry. This is an old technique. People have been pioneering this already in the 60s. And Essentially, it's based on a very simple expression, which is true for any astronomical observation. If you want to take an observation at a given resolution, now this is given by the ratio between the wavelength at which you are taking the observation and the size of the telescope with which you are collecting the light. And given that, as, as I just said, we are upper limited to 10 micro arc seconds, and given that the kind of waves we can collect are radio waves in a millimeter uh, band because these are the waves that actually come very close uh, from the black hole up to us. Well, if you want to match this expression with um, 10 micro arc seconds, you are doomed to use um, intercontinental distances. And that's the idea behind the Event Horizon Telescope, to create 
a virtual radio telescope, which is as big as the whole planet, and is sensitive to millimeter wavelengths. And the idea is then you, you collect radio telescopes. These are not large telescopes, 20, 30 meter size telescopes across uh, the planet. And you put them together into this interferometric array. So for instance, you can take a, a telescope um, in uh, Arizona, SMT, one in Hawaii, and you can put them in an interferometric observation and therefore obtain a telescope which is virtually as large as the distance between Arizona and Hawaii, which is about 3,000 kilometers. Now, this sounds a bit fishy. Um, how is it actually possible? Well, there is a trick behind this, and the trick is that you not only have to record the electric field coming from the radio wave, you also have to record exactly the time of arrival. This ensures that you are really collecting the same wavefront. And that's why all of these telescopes, uh, besides having sufficiently high frequency uh, detectors, they also have very precise atomic clocks by which they uh, measure the, the actual arrival time. And then, you know, all, you can put all of these telescopes together and therefore produce uh, images on different baselines and therefore different resolutions, if you wish. Now, um, this is an example of what has been done. These are the uh, images of M87 star uh, as observed in 2017 and as published in 2019. They refer to four different days, April 5 to April 11. That's because um, we had about a week of observations, but uh, not all every day was a good one. And uh, of course, you need a, a very large number of telescopes who have a, a good, sufficiently good visibility in order to do the observations. But what you can see already here is that these are similar images. They are not identical. Um, some of the features change from day to, to day. And that's exactly what we think uh, should happen because the, the time scale associated with a, a black hole of this mass is of the order of you know, tens of hours, depending on where the light is actually produced. So you don't expect always exactly the same image, but you don't expect huge differences. And this is very different from what actually happens for the black hole in our in our center. Now, I am I am a, not an observer. I haven't actually produced any of the observations or produced any of these images. But what I was tasked with uh, and my group in Frankfurt was to go from this image to a physical interpretation. In other words, understand why we see exactly this as we see it and what does it mean. And so in order to, to do this uh, as a theorist, you need three basic steps, which I'll try to spell out in, 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 in very elementary terms. The first one is you need to understand how matter falls onto a black hole. We do this by making use of GRMHD, which stands for general relativistic magneto aerodynamic simulations in arbitrary space times, not necessarily that of a, of, a, of a curved black hole in general relativity, then you need to understand how light is actually produced and propagates in this space time. And for this, we need uh, ray trace radiative transfer calculations from which we go from the plasma emissivity over to an image. And then you need to compare um, the tens of thousands, if not millions of images that you can produce through simulations. Uh, these are synthetic images with uh, the, the few uh, observed ones. And we have you know, developed a whole scientific production chain that goes from one to three, and I will guide you through that. So let's start with number one, plasma dynamics. You take a bucket of of plasma and you throw it onto a black hole, what happens? Well, this is shown in this simulation, which has been performed here in Frankfurt. Essentially, matter will tend to organize itself into a torus. This torus will be magnetized and will um, accrete onto a black hole. I don't know if you can actually see the movie, Vincenzo, can you? Yeah, okay. So as you can see, there is red and yellow, that's the density of the plasma. And then there is blue and white, that's the magnetization. So it's a measure of how strong and intense the magnetic field is. As you can see, accretion is not a steady 
process. There are times where more matter is accreted, times where there is less matter. It's a bit like being next to a waterfall. The waterfall will give you a steady water supply, but not always the same amount. And now I'm showing you the orientation at which we think we are seeing actually M87. It's, it's almost face on, but not quite. And you have to imagine now to wear radio sensitive glasses and that's what you would see. Now you're not seeing the plasma, you're seeing actually the light, uh, the emissivity of the plasma. And it looks pretty much like a circle. Um, it's not quite symmetric and is not quite identical in the orientation. Now, the way, the reason why it looks so simple is because we are looking at it in a very special orientation. But as the orientation changes, the actual shape of the light will change. This is what happens if you now take into account the fact that um, these observations are made by telescope, which are finite resolution, and that's what you would uh, uh, expect to see. And that's what we actually have seen. So from this experiment or the simulation only, you understand that we have a pretty good understanding of why we should see things as we see them and why we should expect a, a, a donut with something dark inside and why we should expect an asymmetric emission. But I'll be a bit more specific about the, these details. So tracing photons near a black hole is not easy because, we, especially for us, you know, our, all of our lives are exposed to flat space-time dynamics. For us, light is just, you know, propagating a straight line, which is, you know, perfectly true in a flat space-time. But if you are near a black hole, that's not the way you have to think about it. So imagine you have a black hole and you have a thin disk of, of material which is emitting light. And you want to take a photo of this um, at a given angle with inclination i. So first of all, you will get all the photons that are shot and reach you on a straight line. And these are essentially the front part of the disk. Just like you see my face, that's the direct image of myself. But it's going to be photons that are emitted from behind the black hole and in principle should never reach you because they are behind the black hole. But because they are experiencing the dynamics in a curved space time, they will actually reach you. And so it, um, you will see them as well. And to make things even more interesting, you will see also the photons that actually are emitted from the lower sheet of the, of the black hole and of the disk, sorry, and uh, we reach you because they are dwarfed by the black hole. So you probably have seen this image. This image comes from a, a science fiction film. It's called Interstellar. So you can understand now what is it that you're actually seeing. The first part here is the direct image, the image coming straight through you um, if you were on a spaceship. The, the other part, the one behind, that's the part of the of the disk behind the black hole, which is warped and, 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 and warped towards you. And this part below here, that's the part below the disk and is also warped. And you can also see there is a very thin ring, which is called a light ring. And um, I will explain that. And there is also this dark region, darker region, which we call the, uh, the shadow. Now, this is a Hollywood type of image, but it's actually um, containing a lot of correct physical information, although it's not all of it is right. Most of it is right. But the important thing that, you know, the lesson that you learn out of this is that if you have to hide, don't go behind a black hole. It will not help you. Um, now, what we know from these simulations is that the disk is not geometrically thin as in interstellar, but actually geometrically thick and optically thin. So light can just go through it without being absorbed. And the image will depend on the inclination. So this is the image if you were to see it right from the top. And as the inclination changes, uh, the aspect of this uh, image will change and you will see, you know, this darker region appearing either as a single dark region or you may see two of them uh, like so where you see this part here and then this other part here another feature so besides seeing a darker region another feature that you will always see um, unless you are exactly face on is that there is a region which is more bright than the other and that's because that part of the plasma is actually coming towards us at relativistic speed and so it is experiencing what is called a Doppler boost and so will be amplified. 
Now, what is the shadow? Um, the shadow is an evidence of the presence of an event horizon. It's not produced by the event horizon itself. The event horizon cannot be observed. It's a null surface, cannot emit light. But what you can think is, suppose that you have a black hole and you have a source of light. This black hole will emit photons. You can imagine these photons will be like, you know, straight light rays. Some of these light rays will be absorbed immediately by the black hole because they just go straight into the event horizon. But there are other photons which are not going straight into the event horizon. They are going within what is called the photon circular orbit or unstable photon circular orbit. And, and these are photons that are then captured later on, on um, depending on the number of the properties of the photon, they may have one or more revolutions before being absorbed. So now if you are an observer over here, there's going to be clearly a region of light which is uh, missing uh, light because it's been absorbed by the black hole. And that's what we call a shadow. So it's the projected area of the uh, circular photon orbit, which uh, is devoid of, of light. And also you can appreciate that this region here is not pitch black, it can't, because if you have a photon, I don't know if you can see my, my, my cursor, but if you have a photon which is emitted right where I have my cursor, this photon has no problem propagating towards us because it's just, you know, there is nothing absorbing it. It's just photons that are emitted behind you know, the black hole that would be absorbed. And that's why the shadow is not black, it's just a deficit in light. Just to give you some numbers, the event horizon for Schwarzschild is 2m, the photon circular orbit is at 3m, and the projected size at infinity, which is also the impact parameter at this orbit, is about 5.2, square root of 27. Okay, so um, how do you go about um, the, the last step, which is, you know, uh, comparing um, uh, observations with theory? Well, you do a lot of simulations, about um, half of them were done here in Frankfurt. For each simulation, you produce a scenario, which is essentially a variant about how you produce the light. We don't know exactly where the light is produced because we don't know the energy distributions of the electrons, which are those responsible for the synchrotron emission we see. And so you need to have a number of scenarios. And this is just an example of these scenarios. You can see that you know there, there are situations where the shadow is very large and, and the disk is moving counterclockwise and, and vice versa. There are really situations like this where it is clockwise and the shadow is very small. So there is a huge library um, that we have built for doing this and uh, we're not going into the details. And in particular for M87, we built about 60,000 images. And, and then you have to find the best match. And I will not go into the details how you do find the best match, but I would like to propose a, a, a logical equivalent which will hopefully clarify one point. Suppose you are in a stadium. A stadium has about 60,000 people. And, uh, you know, the, the, the World Championship, so this is a good example. And imagine that you have a photo of, of a person, like the ones on the left. And you go to the, and you'd like to know whether this person is in the stadium. So you go to the security officer uh, and, and ask this person whether uh, he or she can help you. And, and this is a person who actually is a physicist and says, of course, I have a very advanced software that will scan all of, of, the, of the photos of the people who are in the stadium and provide you a best match. And, uh, you know, the, the software runs and after a few hours, uh, here comes the security officer and says, yes, this is the answer. Uh, these are the top 10 best matches. And you ask yourself, well, you know, but is this person in the stadium or not? And, 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 and uh, the officer says, well, you know, you don't know physics well enough then. That's all I can tell you. I can tell you that there are 10 top best matches which match with a given high probability. And that's all I can tell you. I cannot be positive given the quality of your photo. And uh, I can also tell you that you can learn at least two important things about the person you're looking for. The first one is that this person most likely has long hair. 
because all of our top 10 best matches have long hair and that this person is probably a woman. So there are two pieces of information you gain out of this, although you don't have the certainty that the person is there. And that's pretty much what we have done with EHT. We have obtained a number, a distribution, a number of images that fits the observation to very high precision. This is an example, okay? The left is observation, the right is a theoretical model. We know everything about the right. So you may think, okay, you know everything about the left. That's not quite so. Uh, just like for the example of the woman, what we know is that what is on the red on the right is actually a black hole, but we don't know exactly and, and the black hole in general activity, but we don't know many of the properties of this black hole. Just to give you a more pragmatic example, in this row at the bottom you have three images which are the same deconvolved images as ones on the top. So the, 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 there is no difference. It's just you taking into account the different. Uh, you know, you're blurring them because of the telescopes, and the three at the bottom give you exactly the same match to the observed images, but they represent very different black holes. Um, the one on the left is a, a black hole which is counter-rotating with an accretion type which is called SANE. The one on the top right is a black hole which is roughly rotating but in the opposite direction. This is called a MAD uh, type of accretion. And the one in the center is a non-rotating black hole at all. And they both all give you the same match with the observation. So this is both good and bad. Um, it's good because it tells you that no matter what black hole spin you have in mind, this is the image produced by a black hole. And it's of course bad because it, you are blind to the spin degree of freedom and you you can't tell what is, you can't measure, at least on the basis of these images only, what is the spin of the black hole. I want to keep within my time, so let me come to the conclusions. Imaging, taking a photo of supermassive black hole is a complex business, requires a lot of expertise. I have very little of it, um, mostly in the theory part. But it requires, you know, taking the, the, the observations with this technique, going from these observations to an image, and then using simulation to explain the image. Over the last five years, uh, we have studied accretion onto, onto curved black holes far more in depth than we have done over the previous 30 years. And we understand now a lot of the, of the properties of this problem. We are starting to look at alternatives to curved black holes. So everything fits perfectly with the idea that this is a black hole in general activity and it's a curved black hole. But you know, there are many other things that can look like black holes. For instance, black holes that are not in general relativity, and right now we cannot distinguish them. I haven't had the time to discuss this, but we can start cleaning up some other possibility like boson stars as explanations. And Maybe the most important contribution that EHT has done to astronomy is that, and physics is that it is transforming the event horizon from a concept, something that I draw, you know, discuss in my lectures in general relativity, over to a testable object. And you know, we studied with Galileo. That's exactly Galileo's idea: transforming, creating a method whereby you can, um, you're not allowed to just have whatever idea you want. But you have a theory and you have to test it against the observations. And this is something that now all of a sudden we can do with, um, with the event horizon. And if you want to know a bit more about what I've said, but also more in general about gravity, and depending on what is your language of selection, this is all contained this, in this book that I have recently published. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Luciano. It was very interesting. I may also suggest uh, uh, another book by Luciano, which is Hydro, the Relativistic Hydrodynamics. It's slightly more exacting than, than this one, I guess. <clears throat> Some more about the, the, the technical the technical part. Um, I suggest that we go ahead and then I, I at least will have some questions for, uh, for each, of, each one of you. Thank you again, Luciano. So our next speaker is Alessandra Roy, and uh, who is with the science-based department of the uh, DLR, German Aerospace Agency, 
She was responsible for several uh, missions of ESA, Plato, Euclid, and Gaia, and has been or still is a project scientist for uh, US German mission Sophia, which is basically an infrared telescope flying on a big uh, on a big um, jumbo jet. And incidentally, she's been uh, she has a long experience in a very long basic interferometry, which is the technique that uh, which Anna has, uh, has alluded to. So yes, I give the floor to Alessandra. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, let's start uh, with a talk, and it's not working. Yes. Okay. So in the next fifteen minutes, uh, we will be talking about infrared uh, spectroscopy from space, but of course we would like to know what is infrared, what is spectroscopy, why from space, from space and uh, um, how we do that. So I also use as uh, the speaker before the pillar of creation as an example, but let's start with uh, the infrared part of the spectrum is uh, between the visible lights and the microwaves. And since the end of the dark ages of the universe, which means when the first star lit the universe, which was about um, when the universe was 200 million year old, um, about half of the energy uh, radiated in the universe has been converted into infrared radiation. And this is because the light is, is and was absorbed by dust grains in interstellar medium and re-emitted in infrared. Uh, the infrared is further divided in near infrared, mid infrared, and far infrared. And depending from the range that the astronomer observed, we see different aspects of the objects observed. Uh, on the left side, you can see the pillar of creation, which is uh, the iconic image from Hubble Space Telescope in visible light. And if you see, it's much more darker than the image on the right, as it was already explained before. Uh, the image on the right is taken by James Webb, the NEOSPEC um, instrument on board. And it is in the near infrared where the gas and the dust in the foregrounds do not block the sight of the star in the background. The near infrared radiation can penetrate dust, dust clouds and reveal their interior because of the large wavelength. In the mid and far infrared, the light is emitted directly from the dust or from matter of fact from other objects like planets or cold objects in the universe. And, and these two regimes, so mid and far infrared, the newly born stars which are inside dust clouds are invisible in the opticals, but by observing this dust cloud in the far infrared, we collect enough information on star formation processes. <laughs> but star formation is not the only things you can have or can observe in, in infrared. Um, as we know, it was also said before, the universe is expanding, is within, the galaxies are moving far away from us, are uh, uh, receding from us, as it's depicted here in the bottom right corner. So, which the movement of the galaxy shift with the radiation that is emitted by such objects toward the red part of the spectrum. And to study the early formed and high redshift galaxies, we need to observe them in the mid infrared, as for example, James Webb does. So here uh, we just say what is spectroscopy. Uh, the father of spectroscopy is actually Newton, who in 1666 <laughs> shows that the light of the white light from the sun could be dispersed into a continuous series of colors which are called cold spectral lines, as depicted here on the top uh, left. Uh, but it was Herschel in 1800 who proved that actually the sun radiation extended into the infrared. And then after him, Kirchhoff and Bunsen uh, realized, demonstrated that each atom and molecules has its own characteristic spectrum. And these are the basis of the spectroscopy. Nowadays, the astronomers um, look for spectral lines, lines from molecules or single atom in space. And in the right side, you can see uh, a newly taken spectra from a redshift galaxy from James Webb. So this is uh, the raw data that then is converted in, could be converted also into images. Why from space? Um, um, well, because uh, the infrared light is absorbed by water vapor and uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. 
And also the atmosphere is causing another problems for infrared astronomers, which is it itself radiating the, in the infrared and often with a greater intensity than the object to be observed in space. So although the near, near infrared is still possible, if you see the image on the top, is you have these blue lines basically covering completely the object in the background that need to be observed. In the near infrared, you can still see something if you have high and dry location, like could be at the Kama Desert or Mount Nakea, so 5,000 meter altitude. But already in the mid infrared, it is impossible, and the far infrared is impossible. And if you go already at 15,000 meters or 15 kilometer altitude in the, in the stratosphere, as Sophia was used to do, you just see much better uh, in the mid and far infrared. And of course, from space, this blue line completely disappeared because the atmosphere is not there any longer. So now that we know what is infrared, how you do it, what is spectroscopy, and why we need to go to space, I am now just going to see shortly what are the instruments that now we have that observe at least different uh, infrared wavelengths, so near, 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 middle, and far infrared. Uh, the picture on the left is a photo of the near infrared spectrograph, near spec, on board of uh, James Webb. It's a quite complex instrument that can observe more than 100 astronomical objects simultaneously. And this is made of it the first spectrograph in space that has this capability. Um, the instrument can select various spectral bands, and this is due to the rotating filter wheels that is uh, at the center of this, uh, well, I don't know if you see the cursor here. Um, and split it and can split this up through the grating wheels, so here, to provide high and medium spectral resolution. Um, what is a spectral resolution is the smallest difference in wavelength that can you can be distinguished, you can distinguish within a line. And by the way, uh, NeoSpec has also a, spec, a low spectral resolution that is provided by a prism. The, the goal of this instrument, the instrument main goal is to observe faint compact, compact objects, uh, for example, uh, deep extragalactic surveys for studying galaxy formation, but also exoplanet atmosphere, as it was also said before. Um, on the right side, uh, we have another spectrograph, which actually is both a spectrometer and a photometer, so it measures also the intensity of the light radiated by the astronomical object. And this is an instrument as part of the Euclid payload. Um, NIST has uh, four different um, low resolution grating plus prism, so it's called a like grism actually, so which is required for simultaneously imaging and doing spectroscopy. Um, but the grease produce a much lower spectral resolution. So NIST has, spectral resolution is much lower with respect to the near spec of James Webb. But what NIST will do is uh, provide the spectrometer part, will provide the spectra of the hydrogen of about 10 of millions of distant galaxies. And this is to determine that their distance in relation, in relation to us. Um, and the spectroscopic data will be then used to describe the distribution of the observed galaxy in space and how the dark matter, dark energy, but also gravity influence their distribution over the last 10 billion years, as it was also mentioned before. Just for, for mentioning, the photometry part will also be used to, in combination with the optical instrument on board too, to derive photometric redshift and uh, rough estimate of distance. Um, here, we go to the mid infrared, and as example, I took, of course, James Webb again, MIRI, and forecast, which was an instrument uh, on board of SOFIA. On the left, uh, there is the mid infrared uh, spectrometer, which is also an imager and is on board of James Webb. Um, MIRI is actually supporting all the science goal of James Webb. It's observed solar si the solar system, so uh, for example, comets and uh, Kuiper belt objects, which are the million of icy objects, which are relics from the solar system early history. But he can also study exoplanetary systems and the early universe. 
Uh, maybe an important characteristic of MIRI is that the instrument is uh, even colder than the other instrument on board of James Webb, about 30 degrees less, um, which is obtained with a cryo cooler, a refrigerator. And this is a requirement for observing in the mid infrared. As stated before, um, in the mid and the far infrared, the astronomer are observing the coldest part of the universe, the coldest object in the universe, which are below minus 130 degrees Celsius. And um, as the operating temperature of the instrument used must be low, and indeed MIRI is minus 260, I think, degrees Celsius. And that is to avoid the thermal, that the thermal noise produced by the instrument itself influence the measurements. Um, on the right side, you can see another immediate infrared instrument, which is the faint object infrared camera for the SOFIA telescope. It is also both an imager and a spectrograph, but with low spectral resolution. And the forecast covers the frequency range where the hydrocarbons, such as the polyaromatic hydrocarbons, has strong spectral features. Uh, these uh, polyaromatic hydrocarbons are astrobiologically significant molecules because they are created in the envelopes of dying stars. And these molecules are then ejected into the interstellar medium and eventually swept up with other material into dense molecular cloud, which in turn could be converted in new stars and planetary systems. And uh, by the way, recently, also this year, um, the data from this instrument brought to the discovery of the water on the sunlit part of the moon. Um, maybe to say Sophia and James Webb, well, Sophia is not flying any longer, but they, they have been complementary. Sophia observed the nearby universe, whereas James Webb observed mostly the distant universe in cosmology. So to be complete, I wanted to mention also uh, the fire infrared part of the story, although currently there are no, no active fire infrared missions. Uh, but have been, so SOFIA and Herschel, for example. Um, at this wavelength, the technology used to build the instrument changed. So we move in what is called the heterodynes detectors, which is a, basically a fancy way to define a radio receiver. So radio, as we all of us mostly have at home, just to listen to the news, for example. Um, and on the left, you can see the great instrument that is was mounted in this case, still mounted on board of SOFIA. And on the right side, you can see Herschel instrument, um, uh, the heterodyne instrument on board of, that was on board of Herschel. Both instruments um, had a very high spectral resolution, which is required to study the cinematic of gas, star formation, and star formation is obviously an essential part of the evolution of the universe. Um, but also the, both the instrument, uh, look at water, so the habitability of a planet doesn't derive direct from temperature, but also from the presence, of course, of water, water and uh, organic material. And the Earth, when it formed, for example, the Earth when it, uh, was hot and dry. So the origin of the Earth, water and organics is still an open question. Um, one of the most likely answer is that the water and this organic material comes from impact with comets or asteroids. And so clearly studying the water on such bodies of the solar system helped the astronomer to understand from where the water on Earth came. So Sophia, for example, had a discovery on a comet uh, a couple of years ago, uh, and they found that the same isotopical composition uh, of water in the comet Viatan and the one that is in the ocean of the Earth. Um, such frequency um, are also reached by the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, ALMA, in Chile, but these bands are, are too high frequency and are more the most difficult to be observed from ground. So you, for doing some far infrared, you, you really need, clearly need to go to space. So now, as a conclusion, so far infrared, uh, sorry. Infrared spectroscopy is better done from outside the troposphere, even better from space. Um, we know that half of the electromagnetic energy in the universe consists of infrared radiation, so studying objects in the infrared is relevant for the astronomer. 
And what you see are the cold objects that are invisible to the optical telescope, but they become visible in infrared. Like, for example, we saw star and planet formation, as James Webb is doing and Sophia was doing. But you can see also chemical assembly of prebiotic molecules, as Sophia was doing. You can understand the galaxy evolution, which is a topic of James Webb, but also Euclid. And you can shed light on dark matter and dark energy, which is the main goal of Euclid. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. It's very nice. So it's uh, so in, in a sense, uh, Webb and, uh, and Euclid in the future will continue the work of this uh, of this almost earthbound Sophia telescope, right? In a way. In a way, yes. So let's say extending okay. with the, the range of possible observations. Mostly James Webb, Euclid is more cosmological, so okay. Sophia was, would have not been able to observe the same thing that Sophia uh, that uh, Euclid does. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this concludes uh, the presentations, and uh, so if there's any question, I will be glad to uh, to give it over to our speakers. Um, so I think what actually one thing that's that struck me uh, is so you said that the MIRI uh, instrument is colder. It's colder than it would naturally be on the on the dark side of the of web, right? So it, it, it's kept at a lower temperature. So how is how is cryogenicity uh, powered in this case? Is that thermoelectricity from the upper side or? That that is a question that I cannot answer. This is not because James Webb is the only things I don't do. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know if uh... I, I know that there is a cryo cooler uh, for me yeah. only. There is a cryo cooler uh, energized by the solar panels of the of the satellite. So it's mm -hmm. the only uh, small part of the telescope which is cooled actively. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, it's it's enough uh, cryo cooler with uh, you know powered by the the solar panels. Mm -hmm. okay. Because I. I... I worked for a couple of years on thermoelectricity and I discovered that it was not just a theoretical exercise as it was for me, but then apparently so the, the Mars rover was powered in part by thermoelectrics and so on. So that's uh, that's an interesting thing. Since I have Adriano on the on the screen. So concerning dark energy, I mean of course I'm a bit naive because I'm a condensed matter physicist, but it's um yeah I, could I be excused for saying that the dark energy and dark matter are just fancy names for the actual value of the cosmological constant, roughly speaking? I think you're, you're muted, Adrian, sorry. Yes, so dark energy is uh, a, so you said a fancy name actually is uh, um, extended uh, vision of the cosmological constant. So there are uh, cosmological models where this uh, is not constant over time, and so okay. you have an evolution with time. And this is something we will test uh, and constrain with Euclid, how much this, uh, um, the, so if you want the equation of state uh, of dark energy changes with time. Um, so dark, dark matter is, uh, is instead uh, is active on smaller scales, and uh, and has nothing to do with the cosmological constant. It ca simply comes uh, from the fa the evidence that at different scales, uh, from the supercluster to single galaxies, we need uh, much more uh, gravity than what we see uh, to explain uh, the dynamics uh, and the structure uh, uh, that we see in the universe. The class uh, of alternative theories. Uh, uh, which may explain these uh, are modified uh, uh, gravity theories. So where you change, uh, you add um, terms uh, to the general relativity uh, equations, so, or to the and uh, and eventually, um, so and they they may in some case explain some of the features that we see, but not them all. So there has been no 
um, no way to reproduce all the different observations we see at different scales, uh, the rotation curves of galaxies, uh, clusters uh, and supercluster, etc., and the way the structures grow over time with uh, uh, modified gravity uh, theories. Said that, 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 as you say, I mean, these are just fancy names for something we don't know, so we are actively exploring, uh, or the theoreticians better are, better are actively exploring potential alternatives which do not uh, uh, entail a new, a new force uh, like uh, uh, like this one. I should say that the, uh, the, con the the tension in the Hubble value in the in the value of the Hubble constant is also uh, potentially pointing to another component uh, because again cannot so we're starting we have recently. Um, the, the discrepancy between the two measurements has currently has just exceeded uh, exceeded the, the five sigma value. So the value where the probability for being random uh, is just too small to be realistic. So um, there are again one of the possibilities uh, that there are even more classes of uh, dark energy in the universe. But as you see, I'm particularly unhappy, uncomfortable in. Uh, uh, in uh, you know, assuming that more and more el elements are there, and uh, and so um, it's it's part of the mystery we have to solve at the moment. Thanks. I, I wonder if uh, if Luciano has any comment about the well the theoretical side of the equation here. Well, as, as Adriano has correctly said, um, energy, uh, dark energy, and dark matter are really two different problems. They share just the objective dark. <clears throat> dark matter is, you know, as far as I can tell, is just a something that is there, uh, most likely a light particle that is um, that just waits to be waits to be discovered. Uh, attempt to explain dark matter via, you know, <coughs> alternative alternative theories of gravity um, so far hasn't hasn't shown any um, success. You know, all of the theories that have been proposed. Uh, either too cumbersome or provide uh, the solution to the dark energy, dark matter, but then fail in, in, in reproducing other things. So, um, so far, the best tested theory of gravity remains general relativity. Um, and, but, you know, general relativity we know is not the ultimate word. Uh, it has a number of problems, uh, in particular when it comes down to black holes. So, a lot of the research that we're doing nowadays is okay what we've seen in terms of black hole imaging is compatible general relativity but there is still room for alternatives can we rule them out or not and in ultimately uh, even if you know everything narrows down to being to general relativity being correct are we really happy with it and uh, you know general relativity is a fantastic theory but there's problems like the information paradox loss. Uh, so the fact that if we throw a stone into a black hole, we then lose information about the composition of this stone. And uh, we, we, this is something that is really disturbing. Or the fact that inside a black hole, there is a physical singularity at r equals zero at the center of a black hole. Again, this is something that we can't accept. Um, we know it has to be fixed in some way or another. We know that a quantum mechanical theory of gravity is the right way of fixing this problem. But so far, all of our attempts in creating a, a quantum mechanical theory of gravity have failed. So um, maybe one has to think uh, anew in this respect. But certainly, so far, all evidence is that Einstein was right. Black holes do exist. And we have to find ways of fixing the problems that um, black holes introduce. Okay, well, of course, you, as you turn a stone, you find uh, new problems. Uh, so there's a question that's actually a bit technical, but maybe you can make sense of that. Uh, it's Michael is asking if it is possible or whether it makes sense to to use a gyrokinetic model for the plasma instead of MHD for the simulation? Okay, that, that, that is a very technical question. Um, 
so the densities that we are dealing with um, when considering accretion onto a black hole um, are too large to be treated from a kinetic point of view. Magnetoaerodynamics represents the easiest way to approach um, the problem because essentially, you know, you treat this plasma as a fluid which is endowed with some electromagnetic fields, and then you study the collective properties, just like as you do in aerodynamics. However, this is an effective theory, um, provides you a model which is uh, as good as it can be, but then at one point it breaks down, and um, it breaks down in those regimes where plasma effects, in particular kinetically related plasma effects are important. For instance, all the dissipative processes. And um, it, it is not a surprise that when we have tried to compare, so M87 was a simple task in a way, because it's, it's mm -hmm. there, it's big, doesn't do much. Um, we see it very clearly because, you know, it's sticking out of the galactic plane. We have very good, um, you know, there's essentially nothing between us and M87. But, as we try to do uh, the, you know, the, the imaging of Sagittarius A star, the black hole in our galaxy, and we entered an, in a number of problems. First of all, we have to go through all of the matter between us and the galactic center, and there is a lot of it. This creates scattering, so the light is no longer just coming to us uh, on a straight line, and uh, there is variability. Sagittarius A star is a very busy place. Uh, everything happens there. It's it's flaring uh, almost daily, and our variability uh, in the intensity of light that we measure of the order of few minutes. So imagine that we need about eight hours to collect and build enough data to, to create an image, and the subject of our emission is changing on timescales of tens of minutes. It's a real nightmare. And so what we found out is that our our models, our MHD models, are having a problem in, in the sense of the variability. Uh, they are two variables. The time scale, the typical time scale by which um, our, you know, the properties of our plasma vary for whatever reason, is too high as compared to what we observe. And this is telling us that our MHD models, while effective, are not the end of the story and uh, we need to improve them. Whether going to a kinetic, gyro kinetic uh, approach uh, is the, the right thing to do, I don't know. I think, you know, any other approach of that order is not very well developed yet, at least in, in the astronomical context. And they are far more expensive in terms of getting, you know, a, an answer. So we need to improve our, our, our model for sure, but I'm not, you know, really confident that, that gyro magnetic approach is the, is the best way. Thank you, Luciano. I, I think I have another question that I guess Brunella or Alessandro or both could comment on. I mean, quite a stupid question, really. I, I remember a picture about uh, the, the accessible, about the various lines in infrared that goes from, uh, I think it was uh, sodium to uh, atomic sodium, I suppose, to uh, some other. Uh, to, to lower, larger uh, wavelengths. So, what is the actual, the, the actual extension of the of the, of the actual range of the infrared, uh, generically speaking, infrared spectrum that is observable by web, and is is the resolution the same more or less everywhere in this in this range, or are there peculiarities that one well that need to be dealt with? I don't know, maybe I, <clears throat> I could say something. Uh, the region covered by the web goes from uh, about um, a bit less than one micron up to 28 microns. Mm -hmm. So the near infrared part is covered by the near spec instrument and, um, and the mid infrared part are going, going from uh, about uh, five uh, micron to 28 micron uh, covered by the MIRI instrument. So um, as, you, as soon as uh, uh, Alessandra has shown you, as, uh, as you go towards uh, the, the mid-infrared uh, range, uh, 
you are more sensible to um, molecules, uh, in, uh, in mo molecular emission, um, and, and colder region, let's say. So passing from the near infrared to the, to the mid infrared, your uh, path to, towards looking at uh, warmer gas uh, to colder gas, let's say, very roughly speaking. Um, the spectral resolution uh, is, a, is very is similar. Um, okay, there are some technicalities in the sense, that the, for example, the MIDI instrument has two modalities, one, one at a lower resolution and, and one at IS resolution. Uh, the IS resolution of MIRI allows us to uh, observe kinematically um, motion of about, uh, um, uh, let's say, 50, 50, 60 kilometers per second which means that with this resolution, you can study the kinematics of uh, galaxies, for example, but uh, it will be a bit too low to, to study the dynamics and ki kinematics uh, in young stellar objects where the, the, the velocity, typical velocity of the gas are uh, much lower. So I don't know if this is what answer your question or if, uh, Alessandra wants to, to add something more. Now, basically, you already covered everything. Um, I can say what Sophia was doing in the far infrared, and uh, basically what was observed was the line at 158 microns, or the carbon line, and that is used as a proxy for star formation because you can't see the star, and so you, by observing the gases, uh, and also in that case, the spectral resolution will really high. And so the velocity, I don't know what was the velocity of grade, but um, yeah, you could distinguish all the, you know, the lines so that you can study the kinematic of the gas. So basically what already Brunella said. Thank you. I think this is, uh, I guess, any a, a moment as good as any other to, to stop it. We've been together for about two hours. Um, and so first thing I would like to Warmly, thanks. Thank my colleagues, if I may, although I'm, a, I'm not an astrophysicist, um, for 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 their very interesting presentation. And uh, if you allow me, I will also thank the uh, not very many, but not as few as I feared, uh, people who have shown up and uh, and stayed with us until the end. I would like that. I would like to do that with a citation, completely outside of the field, by Ben Sidran, who's a pianist. He said something like, "The fact that you chose to spend some time with us tonight speaks highly of you. Speaks highly of us too. You could have stayed home, but you chose not to." So he was referring to, of course, to a jazz club. But this is this is a slightly different environment. But nevertheless, I think it's a uh, it is appropriate to thank our audience. It's been, uh, oh, I'm, I'm not too unhappy with, uh, with the participation. So I think that's it. And I thank you again and hope to uh, sometime soon, uh, perhaps uh, meet in person in Berlin at some point. That would be a nice thing. Okay. Thank you very thank much. You, okay. Thank you, Vincenzo. Have a nice evening. Bye. Have a nice Bye. 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 Bye.